Hi, I'm delighted um, to be, have been part of this wonderful series uh, at Mendes called Fruits of Their Honest Labor, and today's the last of the series. And we are very thrilled that Marla Miller is going to be giving our last talk called The Last of Mantua Maker. Marla is, um, teaches at UMass Amherst. She teaches American history and public history. Marla got her undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin and her PhD from the University of North Carolina. And she has a book which will be published by UMass Press this fall. And the title, which will sound a lot like a little bit of what you're going to hear today, is The Needle's Eye, Women and Work in the Age of Revolution. So welcome to Marla. Thanks, Susan, for that, and thanks to Susan and Michelle both for inviting me to be here today. I've got to tell you, I'm, uh, my teaching load is half public history and half early American, and I'm doing two courses on the revolution this semester, both for my undergraduates and my graduates, and so to be in this space is particularly exciting for me today. Um, I hope I'm not too distracted by Sam Adams and his spirit to think about Mantua makers today. Um, and I also want to give some thanks to the organizations that funded this research. Uh, it started about six years ago on a fellowship uh, with the National Endowment for the Humanities that I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. And I finished up this uh, section of the research last summer on a fellowship with the Mass Historical Society. So I want to say that I'm grateful to them, too, for supporting this work and to all of you for coming out today. Um, so this project started for me about six years ago. I was working on the research for this book that's about to come out, and that is on women and the clothing trades in rural Massachusetts, mostly Hampshire County and the Connecticut Valley. And I came to Boston on this fellowship looking for more information on mantua makers. Now, how many of you have come today knowing what a mantua is or a mantua maker? Just a few. So I'll um, use the slides to show you. Can I focus from here? Oh, I can. No, I can't. Melinda, can I ask you to do that? Yep. That's great. All right. So you probably don't know the word mantua maker, but you probably know the word dressmaker. Yes? And it's that transition from man to a maker to dressmaker that I want to talk about today. It's that shift from one to the other that interests me as a historian. My research, when I first started this project, I knew that mantua making, now the mantua is this dress that's open in the front, that's a petticoat, a quilted petticoat beneath that, and the gown that encloses it, that's the mantua maker. So women who made those for other women were mantua makers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the construction and why that's important in a minute. Uh, but I knew coming in that mantua makers had come to New England with the first migration. There were mantua makers here in the mid, at least by the mid 17th century. And that at that point in time, they were both women and men. And that was consistent with what was true in Europe. Women in the 17th century were only making their way into the production of fitted formal clothing for women that had been completely controlled by men up to that point. In 1675, we see the first guild in Paris for women who are making clothing for women. And about that time, women start, this fashion first comes in. It's easier to make than what preceded it. The, um, the shaping part, the stays, I imagine most, most of you are familiar with stays, are separate from the gown in this construction. Prior to this, that was all integral, separating the fitted the part that um, shapes your body from the gown itself opened this career up to women who could make the gown and didn't have to make the, the boning. So in the 17th century, this gown becomes very fashionable. At the same time, women are trying to make their way into the craft. And one of the arguments they use for that is to say that modesty demands that female clients have female craftswomen making their clothing. And so it's really in the 17th century that women start defining mantua making as a job most appropriate for women. And over the course of the 18th century, you see men sort of fading from that scene. And so by the time we get to revolutionary Massachusetts, which is kind of where my study starts, men are very rarely mantua makers. So this is partly about a uh, 
a shift in gender divisions of labor. So I came to Boston, I'm doing this research, and uh, I was looking at a lot of materials, including the Boston City Directories, to find women who were working as mantua makers. And since I had thought about the beginning of the trade, I thought, well, I should really follow this through to the end. I wonder how long this trade goes. I'm just going to keep reading these city directories until there are no more mantua makers. How long can that really take? Well, it took four solid weeks of research, scanning that middle column in the old directories before they were sorted by uh, occupation. And hundreds of thousands of directory entries later, I had an answer. Boston's last man to a maker was Rebecca Major. In 1845, after about a dozen years as a Boston man to a maker, Rebecca Goodwin Major closed up her shop. Of the several hundreds, even thousands, of women who had made clothing for the women of Boston and its surrounding communities over the city's 200-year history, she was the very last to call herself a mantua maker in the pages of the city directory, well after the lion's share of her competitors had abandoned the 17th century term for the more up-to-date nomenclature, dressmaker. Born in Cambridge in the 1770s, Rebecca married pump and block maker Frederick Major in April 1799, and the couple moved into Boston. She hung out her official shingle in the pages of the city directory in 1828, though I suspect she was practicing her craft long before then. The uh, census of 1810, for example, shows the household with uh, one boy and five little girls. And since I haven't found references to her own children, I think that these girls were probably her apprentices. So I think she's practicing much earlier than that. She first lists herself, though, as a mantua maker in the directory in 1828, a significant year for her. That's the first year of her widowhood. Frederick had died the summer before. After that, she continued to list her trade in the columns of the city directory until 1845, nearly a quarter century after a rising generation of artisanal women had embraced the new term dressmaker. With the retirement of the 68-year-old craftswoman, an occupation that had been among the most prestigious available to American women since the 17th century, at the summit of what people have called the female aristocracy of labor, faded from the Boston scene. So having to stick with Rebecca until as late as 1845 to find this moment in Boston's labor history was no small trick for a historian like myself, who is you know, more comfortable in the 18th century and really more comfortable literally and metaphorically in rural settings, but here I was in the city trying to find the end of my mantua makers. What's more, it, so it's hard for me to keep going into uh, 1845, but what was more important about that, I think, is that it was surprising me. Mantua making is really a 17th century term, and to see it persisting so far into the 19th century was something I hadn't really counted on. So it made me start to ask some questions. Why had Major held on to this outdated, outdated term for so long? What did it mean when it was finally abandoned? For me, that semantic event offers a point of departure from which to explore both continuity and change among urban artisans from the end of the American Revolution to the second quarter of the 19th century. So my talk today draws on a database of about 640 Boston women who were both mantua makers and dressmakers, the fruits of that labor going through the directories, from 1789, which is the first year that the directory was published, until Major disappears in 1845. And I should say that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's a study by a historian named Naomi Lamoureux, and she was interested in Boston clerks. And she found that uh, there's something like uh, 176 men identified as clerks in the Boston City Assessor records, and only 31 of those are listed as clerks in the directory. So they're, the people who choose to list themselves with an occupation in the directory represent only a percentage of the people in Boston who are working at a particular trap, craft. So in order to get at this today, I thought I would share with you two kinds of evidence. And one are the gowns themselves that help us think about this trajectory between 1790 and the 1840s, and then also the city directories and what kind of evidence is contained there. And then by way of conclusion, I'll throw out some ideas about why I think she might have made the choices that she did, our Rebecca. So in order to understand artisanal work, one has to understand the uh, changing shapes of the artifacts these women crafted. And there are three eras in the history of women's clothing that come into play here, the Georgian, the Federal, and the Romantic era. So I just want to show you a little bit about the world of clothing that's changing during Rebecca Major's lifetime and what we might discern from that. First, I want to quickly explain the uh, nature of artisanal skill in the clothing trades, and that's really the measure and the cut. 
One of the myths that has long endured about early American women is that they tended to make their own clothing or made the clothing that the people in their household consumed. And that's true for some kinds of garments, but not all. And the, the main distinction is two dimensions versus three dimensions. So if you think about, like if somebody gave me some fabric and said, make a shirt, I would know to cut a hole in the middle, you know, I'd drape it over my head, I'd cut a hole in the middle, and then I'd cut this out, and all these rectangles might give me a shirt. It wouldn't be fitted, but it would work. That's a two-dimensional conception of clothing. So shirts, shifts, petticoats, like this one that you see here, that's basically a rectangle. The only fit that that involves is drawstrings at the waist that pull it close, but there's no construction technique that's giving you fit. Two-dimensional clothing are the kinds of things that most women could make for their, for their families and did and maintained for their families. The higher level of skill comes in when you're looking at something like this fitted bodice in this gown. Most people in early America had one garment that was good enough for church, good enough for special occasions, and those garments were fitted. So if you look at how close this fits her in the bodice, and a lot of times in this period, posture was very important, and so clothing helped people carry their bodies in particular ways. And so the uh, sleeves are shaped so that her arms have the graceful bend that was expected of genteel women in the period. That kind of construction was not easy to do, and that's the kind of thing that people hired mantua makers to do. They might just do the cut. There's a lot of examples of people going to mantua makers, having them cut and baste the pieces of the garment together, and then they can take it home and sew it up once it's put together. But fabric was extremely expensive in this period. And even if you're using something like a good stout linen that was made in your community, or if you're purchasing some sort of imported fabric, it's too expensive for you to take a uh, shot at cutting it yourself, because one wrong move, and it's all ruined. So. Um, Artisanry in the clothing trades encompasses those sort of conceptual abilities, the idea of how to cut these pieces so that you're going to wind up with that shape, the manual abilities involved in sewing. And there's also something important to be said about use of the materials. Uh, gown makers knew the properties of various materials and how they would respond when you're converting them into three-dimensional garments. So I have a nice example of a, uh, a woman who writes a novice gown maker. She's the, the younger woman is going to make a gown of silk. And the older woman says, are you remembering that silk does not stick to you like cambric? It sets off and needs to be longer than anything else. So if the letter didn't get there in time, she would have cut her dress too short. It would have been too high off the ground. All that fabric would have been ruined. So skilled artisans know how to manipulate those materials effectively. All right, now we'll move on to style. The years of political upheaval and nation building that I'm looking at here witnessed not one but two revolutions, one in politics and another in style. For most of the 18th century, women's most fashionable gowns were substantive affairs, constructed of heavy fabrics like this one, in forms that accentuated volume, width, and depth, if you look at the bell of that skirt. Here's another example. You see the wide hips, very in. You've got to love the 18th century. Um, here's more a closer to the everyday form of clothing, but again, you can see, even though this dress is not nearly as high style as the previous ones, it's still important to have a nice close fit around the bodice, but you don't want wrinkling, you don't want gaps, and that's the kind of fit that a professional can give you. Now here you see a gown from the 1770s, and what I want to draw your attention to here are the trimmings. In the revolutionary era, not only do you have, you can see here again, she's got the closely fit bodice, she's got the tight sleeves, but then look at all those trimmings. If you look at, there's technical things called robing and ruching and all of this, and I don't think we need to get into that, but you can see that this has been applied on each side. It probably cascades down the whole front of the skirt. You see these lace things at the sleeves. There are also little bands that come around the sleeves. In the 18th century, pinking wasn't done with shears like we do it today. You had a little mallet, and the mallet had the triangles on it, and you would put your cloth that you want pinked on it and smack it along and make the ribbon. So when you think about a, rib a gown like this that's going to have pinking all the way down or around the bottom, there's a lot of labor and a lot of craftsmanship involved in that kind of apparel. Here's another example of gowns from this era, a little bit plainer, but if you can make it out, there's still ribbons and trims around her bodice. 
This is the real killer. This is uh, Mrs. Benjamin Talmadge, Mary Floyd Talmadge. And the monumentality of this gown by itself is very impressive. And when I look at that, I really can't see the wearer. What I see is the maker. If you think about what was all involved to construct this gown so that it fits her tightly here, fits tightly through the sleeves, has this big graceful bell, and then all of this embellishment, the ribbons, the roping, all of that. That's a real uh, tour de force for some man to a maker somewhere. So now, if you think of the volume of this, the gowns of the Georgian era, oh, there's another one that has nice trim going up it. You can see what the gown maker is doing to produce all of that. So even while the, the basic structure remains constant, in the 1780s, a lot of the skill is in applying these trimmings. So here she is again. We see the size of it. And then this is what comes next. At the end of the 18th century, the clothing trades, like woodworking trades and, and other artisans more generally, witness a dramatic shift, a move away from the effusive style of the Rococo and a growing preference for the clean and neat lines of the neoclassical. There are a lot of reasons behind this. Partly it's just the familiar swing of the pendulum, exuberance necessarily answered by simplicity. Prevailing philosophical winds also played a role. Rousseau's emphasis on simplicity and closeness to nature encouraged elites to adopt plainer styles. Excavations at Pompeii fed fascination with classical antiquity, and you can see the allusion in this, this kind of garment to Greek statues and women trying to appear that they fit into that continuum. Once America started forging a new government based on principles of republicanism and democracy, these new opportunities in design seemed all the more appropriate in the U.S. Cultivating a neoclassical style was the perfect enterprise for a new nation eager to make its own claims as inheritors of the legacies of Greece and Rome. In 1796, a guy named Thomas Dwight, who's from Springfield, was here in Boston and writing back home about fashion to his family. And he captures the introduction of that new style in a way that I think is really um, fun. Here's another example of this. Miss Gorm and Miss Parks were, as I suppose, dressed a la mode. No waists, for these are not fashionable. A proper display of the neck with some transparent coverings over the et cetera and et cetera brings you fairly to the apron string. It is a lamentable consideration that the sex have lost so important a part of their bodies. But it cannot be helped for fashion, like Robespierre and Marat, have, have, deal havoc and destruction without ever assigning a reason. I, you can tell he's pretty bummed about the et cetera, et cetera. Uh, women like Gorham and Parks embrace these new fashions with enthusiasm, creating particular opportunities but also challenges for artisans in the clothing trades as craftswomen across New England were asked to make gowns plum. So women who had gowns, like that, the everyday blue gown that you saw, would hire a gown maker to clear out that skirt, make it plum, make it fit more like this silhouette. And so there's a lot of opportunity there in alteration in this period. But also, constructing gowns like this is something new. And for a lot of uh, artisans in the clothing trades, this was something they really had to struggle to master. This was not a style that came out of craftspeople and was imposed on consumers. This was a style that consumers came to craftspeople and said, this is what I want you to do for me. And sometimes they struggled to do it. Uh, the 1796 Tailor's Guide, so this is the same year that Thomas Dwight is observing fashions in Boston, captured their complaint. Tailors had been accustomed to cutting waists fully nine inches long, close to the natural form of the body. But by 1796, as they wrote in this uh, guide, since the quick transition of fashion, we are obliged to cut them but three inches in the same place for the length to figures of the same height and stature. Stripped of every guide that nature pointed out as a direction for fitting the body, both tailors and gown makers scrambled to devise new ways to meet demand while maintaining the same levels of craftsmanship. Uh, for gown makers, this radical shift in silhouette was probably a mixed blessing. Like tailors, you do see surviving garments from this period where you can tell that the gown maker is struggling to get the right fit. So there's um, oh, alterations in the back that look a little unplanned as they're trying to get this uh, tightly fitted bodice up here, but then the right flow beneath that. There are pros and cons here that I don't really know uh, how they played out for craftswomen. 
On the one hand, the simpler architecture of the neoclassical style meant that the steps involved to create a garment were significantly reduced. So you don't see all that trim, for starters, right? There's not a lot of application of those extras. Mid-century gowns, like those you've been looking at, had typically involved running stitches, back stitches, whip, and hemming stitches. Fit might demand any kind of arrangement of pleats, gathers, darts, and embellishments could include anything from robings, ruching, and fringe to multiple layers of ruffles, ornaments that themselves may have acquired or required additional effort. By contrast, something like this is constructed to accentuate the long columnar drape of the skirt with just simple shaping at the bust line and small cap sleeves. The gown's fabrics, too, were sometimes shockingly sheer and a lot of times worn over like a pale pink slip beneath to all but reveal the wearer's body. Once mastered, this new style may have been a boon to busy craftswomen. As one observer commented, these slips, the undergarment, were so simple that, quote, a dressmaker could cut and baste three in a day. However, those long side seams, which once required only loose stitching to assemble, now demanded significantly greater attention because they are lighter fabrics. While just six or eight inches stitches to the inch sufficed for those heavier fabrics popular in previous years, the sheer lightweight materials favored at the turn of the century required more like 10 or 12 stitches per inch to be fastened securely. So that's almost doubling the amount of sewing involved in the gown skirts. Moreover, since these slips were pretty simple and worn beneath a garment, women weren't as motivated to hire a gown maker to make them. Uh, one boss and woman told her daughter, who had some light pink sarcenet to be made into a slip, I should think you could do it yourself. It is only to wear under muslin, but do as you please. So she's saying, you can hire somebody to make this for you if you want, but I don't know why you couldn't do that yourself. So there again, there's a stage of it that might be undermining the uh, clothing that the gown makers made. It's too soon to tell the evidence isn't systematic enough. Gown makers left very little in the way of financial records. I think I know of two account books from Boston gown makers during this period. So I don't know how this really affected their wages or whether it increased their wages because they could do more business. But one thing I've noticed is that during this period, a lot of artisanal women seem to diversify their enterprise. In 1811, Boston's M. Hills notified readers of the Sentinel that in addition to mantua making, she could produce coats, habits, and spencers. Boston's Mrs. Burnham and her partner, Miss Lee, joined forces to open a Temple Street business that catered to a mixed clientele. In addition to tailoring and mantua making done in the newest fashion, as their ad read, they cut and made gentlemen's surtouts, coats, pantaloons, vests, etc., as well as ladies' habits and pelisses, and morning dresses, as they said in their ad at the shortest notice. Other craftswomen started maintaining shop goods, inventory, so that they had a little bit something extra going on. As the 1810s gave way to the 1820s, style was transformed once again, and a new spirit emerged as the rationality of the federal era likewise was supplanted by a heightened interest in the romantic. Oh, this is, this is a writing habit from the late 18th century, and I'm going to talk about habits in a minute. But this is the romantic style that I imagine looks familiar to you guys, too. Now, look, think about, again, the change between one style of gown that is so slim and slight, and now we're, we're into volume again, a whole different kettle of fish. Federal-era fashions had looked to antiquity for insight. Style now, in this new period, reached toward the era of the Renaissance for new inspiration. Costume historian Lynn Bassett has written about this, and she notes that, quote, history provided comfort and an escape from the stresses of a rapidly changing society. Gothic ideals of chivalry and faith prevailed, while the economic and cultural triumph of the Renaissance was represented by the adaptation of 16th and 17th century styles for Romantic period fashion. So lace collars edged in points became popular, and I do have a handout. I didn't have slides of that kind of thing, but uh, there's a nice lace collar on the back of the, the dryer today. That's Electa Beryl Wilder, her portraits at the Worcester Art Museum. So you look at those lace collars edged in points. They become popular, and you can almost imagine John Winthrop in something like that. Uh, ruffs that alluded, ruffs like she's wearing in this portrait, alluded to Elizabethan England. Sleeves, in particular, are noticeable here. They're all but absent during the previous era, but here they become a focal point of fashionable gowns as their fullness 
also reflected interest in 16th century style. By the end of the 1820s, and this is a gown from about 1830, sleeves had become so voluminous that dressmakers had to devise new ways to support the additional fabric. Downfilled pads, stiffened inner lining, and whalebone made possible this fulsome leg of mutton sleeve that became the era's hallmark. Lastly, and perhaps the most obvious element of late Renaissance fashion revived in this period, is the pelerine, which is that large white collar, which is again based on the 17th century falling band. Pelerine is actually French for pilgrim, and it connotes the short cape that had been worn by religious pilgrims in the Middle Ages. So this is very much a romantic, backward-looking style, but you can see that its construction demands very different things. These dramatic changes in silhouette prompted other kinds of changes in uh, undergarments, the desire to achieve this hourglass figure in particular. This created new opportunities for women as corset makers. As early as 1810, a Mrs. Henry sought, quote, apprentices to the mantua making and corset business, while a Mrs. Roberts, newly arrived from London, advertised herself as a dressmaker, milliner, police, and corset maker. Parisian dressmaker and milliner Madame Durbeck advertised corsets from her Court Street shop in 1820. The first corset makers to appear in the pages of the city directory were Sarah Lake and Betsy Litchfield, both of whom are listed in 1825, and a number follow. So those changes start to reconfigure the clothes making industry. At the same time, the booming textile industry affected skills necessary among successful gown makers. Pattern fabrics come back into vogue. They were unpopular during the previous period when you want to achieve this appearance of being like a Greek statue, but now pattern comes back in. And it's at the same time as this large scale, power driven textile industry hits full stride. So there are now booming varieties of fabric, ribbons, trimmings, all reeling off looms in the 1820s and becoming integral to the creation of fashionable apparel. Gown makers needed to know how to make the most of this. For instance, a striped material might be cut on the bias and matched to form chevrons on the gown's bodice form. So again, new opportunities, new challenges. Fashions emerging in this period also offered opportunities for women to specialize in the making of new garments that emerged in these years. For example, increasing numbers of women specialized in police and habit making. A garment that blended features of both gowns and coats, the police was made necessary in part by the increasingly lightweight dresses that you saw of the early 19th century. With little protection from the gown itself, the police, which is sort of an overdress or coat that still fits relatively close to the figure, styled along the same lines, the high waist, as fashionable gowns, and eventually extending all the way to the floor, proved increasingly desirable. So the other illustration on your handout is a running coat. And it's, I don't have a slide of a police, but it'll give you an idea of this kind of garment that emerged during this period. The other interesting thing about this is that habits reappear. Habits in the 18th century had been made by male tailors because, as you recall, they, um, oh, maybe I can't go backwards. Now I can't go forwards. That's the last slide, so it's okay if we can't get it to go. Um, but if you can picture that uh, woman in the riding habit, that's a garment that is based on a man's coat, and so they were mostly made by tailors in the 18th century. Then there's a long period of time that no habit makers appear in the Boston City Directory. The, the uh, form goes out of style. So between 1805 and 1821, there are no habit makers that appear in the directory. After that, all habit makers who do appear are women. As is typical, this shift appears in the newspaper before it emerges in the directory. Mrs. Roberts' 1810 announcement of her arrival in the city listed her various trades as dressmaker, milliner, police, corset, and habit maker, while in April 1811, Mrs. Hills assured Bostonians that she continues to make coats, habits, and spencers. In 1818, partners Burnham and Lee made habits together with their other inventory. So the evolution of fashion between the 1790s and the 1840 is a story of both continuity and change. As the 19th century unfolded, new styles embracing curve-hugging bodices and complex construction put new emphasis on obtaining a proper fit from an experienced craftswoman. In the era before published patterns, style evolved by a process of accretion. Construction techniques drew on past practices modified by innovation. In this environment, it was the adaptability of skill itself that became an asset for aspiring craftswomen. Rebecca Major was born during that Georgian era. 
became a young woman herself as those fashions were overturned by the neoclassical style, and first advertised her skills in the city directory when the style's pendulum had swung back once more in the other direction. Over the course of her lifetime, the craftswoman observed dramatic change in the shape and style of the garment she was constructing. Though across all of these changes, her sense of herself, her artisanal identity, remained constant. She continued to call herself a man to a maker. Now I want to turn to the city directories and explain why I think that's so interesting. In that same year that fashion is fluctuating so dramatically, the word dressmaker appears. And if you look at um, a couple of the tables that I have in front of you, you can see on table two that women are appearing a little bit more in city directories, but not that much more. So they're getting a foothold in the city, but only a slight one. Table three suggests some of the places they're finding new opportunity. It's table four that I think is really interesting, showing the changing distribution of participants in Boston's clothing trades over this time period. You see tailors growing steadily. You see the decline of slop shops and the emergence of ready-made clothing stores over toward the right-hand side. Uh, that latter uh, occupation is in particularly important among African Americans in Boston, which I think is interesting. Manufactories start to provide opportunities for white male owners who employ legions of women. One, uh, one man that I've turned up in my study was asked how many women he employed, and he said he couldn't guess within 500. So legions of women who are not going to list their occupations in the directory are getting into ready-made clothing through that avenue. Looking at the dressmaking trade, you can see the transition from man to a makers to dressmakers. You see the number of man to a makers shrink, the number of dressmakers expand, which I think is maybe more about the growth of dressmaking than the demise of man to a making. As the second quarter of the 19th century progressed, the number of women who identified themselves as dressmakers surged. In these same years, the making of women's apparel began to adopt the compartmentalized work routines that the making of menswear had embraced decades earlier. And I think this is how we account for the rise that you see between 1810 and 1816. All of a sudden, there are a lot more tailoresses, a lot more seamstresses, and I think that that has to do with the tasks involved in creating these gowns being compartmentalized. It's also interesting to me that starting in 1830, the number of milliners in the city levels off, whereas the number of dressmakers and mantua makers more than doubles, 230% increase over that period of time. There's still a lot that I don't know about why somebody like Rebecca Goodwin Major would have clung to the term mantua maker while all of these other women were embracing a new term. It's interesting to me that the first time this uh, term appears in the directory is 1821. She continues to reject it until 1845. I'm wondering what that means for her. In, in Boston, when the directories were compiled, the uh, men who worked for the publishing company would come around and show you last year's entry and ask if you wanted to make any changes. So every year, women in this trade were asked which term they preferred. And if you look at them, some of them changed right away. Some, they changed at very different times. And so I'm wondering what kinds of things were behind that decision-making process. And I'm just going to throw out one possible explanation that I really like, and this was explained to me or suggested to me by Janae Whitaker, who's a, she runs the mantua-making shop at Colonial Williamsburg. In the 18th century, the word dress was not a synonym for a garment as much as it was a synonym for the word style. And so Janae suggests that as mantua makers become dressmakers, craftswomen are become style makers. You know, when we think of dressmakers in the 19th century, we tend to think of these sort of grand dame artistes who are dressing out their clients. And I wonder if that shift from mantua maker to dressmaker isn't some indication that these women are trying to position themselves as style makers, which is something new. And I think the flip side of that is that women like Rebecca Major may be resisting what seems to her to be a de-skilling. As the uh, trade is compartmentalized, there are more seamstresses, more tailoresses, more women who are semi-skilled. I wonder if Rebecca Major doesn't cling to man to a maker, the 18th century term, because she wants to convey something about the kind of work she does or the kind of client she hopes to attract, their age or their wealth. She's trying to position herself as something from the old days that's still valuable. And that interests me. Whatever her reasons, when she finally laid down her shears, she could look back at a long career in trade that evidenced both change and continuity. The world she left was not the one she entered. 
Legions of women now found themselves enmeshed in vast networks of sewers producing ready-made apparel for men. Emerging fashions for women had created new occupations and enlarged women's access to others. Dressmaking would engage unprecedented numbers of practitioners, an expanding community of practice that was only on the eve of what would become known as its own heroic age. Upon her retirement, the city's last mantua-maker looked out on a field that contained more than 100 women, heirs to a century and a half of craft tradition, who also saw themselves in a new light, women who cultivated new skills, who embraced new opportunities, and encountered new challenges in a rapidly changing economy and society. Thank you. I'd love to take questions if people have any. In the very first style that you showed, where the women had a very tight, boned bodice, mm -hmm. I think, and I'd need to your answer, that the bodice was a separate piece than a skirt. In other words, the outfit took care of two pieces so that you could put the bodice sort of over the waist of the skirt, and therefore it would have been two separate pieces rather than a whole dress, which would have been one. Right. They're, both of those things existed in this period, and you're right. The other thing I should have said is that instead of, like, the fastening in this period is really just pinning things together. Historic Deerfield has a gown that's sewn together on wearing. So you'd, you'd put it on, you'd sew it up, and then when you need to take it off, you needed to cut that. And so... So, yeah, you, you make a good point that the, these gowns are not dresses in the way we think of them today necessarily. And they're also made with detachable sleeves. That They're made to be versatile. Did they not have hooks in those days like we would call hook and eye? I do not think so, but I don't know when hook and eye, I don't know if anybody here knows when hook and eye emerged, but I do not think it's this early. I think it's mostly pins at this point. Who is the one that created the changes in styles? Where does it come from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in the 18th century, for the most part, it's before there's any kind of fashion press. And so the way that women learn about new fashions is by observing other women wearing them. And so part of it happens when elite women from New England travel to Europe, see things there, and come back. In fact, and sometimes it's craftswomen as well, but one of the best things I found at the Mass Historical Society is this sweet, sweet little notebook that's clearly a mantua maker's notebook. She's in England. She sees a gown that she thinks would be perfect for this client of hers. And so she writes that down. This would be perfect for so-and-so, and she makes notes as to what it looked like. Then she's going to come back and make that gown for her client. Then other people see the gown and say, oh, could you do that for me? And so that's really how fashion changes. It's the uh, client saying, I saw so-and-so, she had a dress like this, you know, it poofed out here, it was tight there. And that's how dressmakers were really trying to deliver their clients' demands. So in Hadley, which is where a lot of my study unfolds, women come to Boston, they'll have a gown made. They'll come back to Hadley, the gown is very fashionable, and so then the local dressmaker will take it apart so that she can see how it was made, make a duplicate of it from those pieces, and then put it back together and the woman has it. But that's, since this is a period before patterns moved around, it's correspondence, people writing, drawing little sketches, and it's really people seeing gowns on other people's bodies and saying, I want mine to be like that. Well, would that be the same in Europe? Because um, it originates somewhere in Europe. The how, do they, how does this all begin? I mean, who makes the styles in the first place? Well, now that's a, that's a more philosophical question. One thing historians debate is, is whether it's top down, is it somebody like Marie Antoinette does something and then everybody copies her and it moves its way down through the social chain. But then there's evidence, so this is what people call the emulation thesis, but at the same time, there's evidence that things trickle the opposite direction. So if we think about our own culture and the kind of the way that the hip-hop clothing that's popular with young boys makes its way into the larger culture, you know, that's another direction of influence. And so I think it just comes from all different directions. There's a, that same guy that I quoted, Thomas Dwight from Springfield, in one, in one letter reports to his family that everybody, there's a vogue for looking like the British sailors. And so all of a sudden everybody wants to have the same check shirts that they do and jackets that look like theirs. And so I think it's not unlike today that something, the cool people in the 18th century start a fashion and then other people try to model it. 
Fashion press doesn't emerge. Fashion press emerges at the end of the 18th century. And so it's the 19th century when people are starting to look at ladies' magazines and learn the fashion. It seems like in that part of the uh, time, uh, from, uh, from judging from the, the, the patterns that we saw, or the dresses that we saw, the, the fitted part uh, would be very, I don't, know, I don't know how pregnancy would work into it. They didn't seem to have any maternity dresses. It would seem to be very expensive to have something fitted to you. And it seemed to me also that people at that time, women at that time, were spending much of their time being pregnant. And I was wondering how that fit, pardon the pun, into yeah. the <laughs> That's a good one. Um, that's a really good question. And what I've mostly seen there is women remodeling old gowns to accommodate a pregnancy. And so they'll take something that is close to uh, wearing its usefulness and have somebody remake it into what, what I've seen called a loose gown. This woman in uh, Connecticut wrote something about having a gown remade into a loose gown, which she feels is more decent for her at that point. And then she says something like, if I survive this, I think I'll have a new dress made. And so you see her looking anxiously ahead to being able to wear something nicer. There's uh, only a couple. There are very few examples of maternity wear that survive in America. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg has a fabulous quilted maternity outfit. It's unbelievable. Uh, there's a gown at Old Sturbridge Village that appears to be a nursing gown. It, opens up in all the right places. And uh, there's a gown, this also might be at Sturbridge, Betsy Barker McComber, is that there's a maternity gown from her. But they're mostly older gowns that were altered. You're right, that they wouldn't have made them just for that purpose. And those, like the petticoats, you know, that's just drawstring. And so they're good for all seasons. And so if you're wearing like a short gown, which is like a blouse really today, and a petticoat, you know, fit's not really an issue. I was wondering about the mindset that would go from a very, very voluminous gowns, say up to about 1795, and then accept a very, very thin silhouette, and then in a comparatively short time accept another set of voluminous gowns. Wouldn't that wreak havoc with their wardrobe budgets? Well, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, part of that, I think, is generational. So as like women who are already mature when the new fashions come in are not going to wear those white, sexy dresses. They're going to have gowns in heavier fabrics remade with a higher waistline so that they're more fashionable, but they're not going to go all the way. And I think that that's what you see, is people don't all indulge in the style at its most uh, exorbitant. It kind of makes me think today, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but mini skirts and long skirts. You know, we've, we've seen this in our lifetime where, you know, skirts were at the knee and then they're very high and then they're long. And, and you, you do have to, you know, you accommodate those styles. Not everyone does, I should say, accommodate those styles. And I wonder if it's not similar that whereas the young people might all go into for the mini skirt, older women are going to continue to wear the, the clothes that they have. And not everybody is going to participate in these changes and they're not going to participate to the degree that we saw here. But you're right, it's a lot, I mean, remaking clothing, you can't remake the neoclassical gowns into that big style of the romantic period. That's all got to be done again. But when do we get to the point where the fashion is decided by somebody else and the colors that are changing every seven years that are the same in the towels and the clothes? And I mean, we're in a very different time, yeah, I think, today. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I think when you say someone, I mean, it sounds to me like the question is when does that sort of come from the commercial, like when is it commercially driven as opposed to popularly driven? And that I really don't know. I mean, I would guess that that's going to happen with the uh, advent of the textile industry. Like once those, you know, machine-made cottons are churning off the, you know, off the weaver's looms, then somebody's invested in having this year's colors and can manipulate that more. I think before factory-made textiles, nobody can be talking about this year's colors because you can't control that as well. So I, that's my, I don't know that for a fact. It's a, it's a good question. And I'm guessing that it comes with the American textile industry. 
was the sewing machine brought into popular? When did the seamstresses or the tailors start using hands, you know, the small sewing machine? Sure. Uh, the sewing machine was invented before the Civil War, but it didn't really catch on until after the Civil War. So in theory, it's available as early as the 1840s and 50s, but most women don't develop any interest in that until about the 1870s. And then you see women saving up for a sewing machine. Mostly, or at least what I've seen, is so that they can participate in outwork networks, so that they can make, they're not making, the women who buy those sewing machines are not making high status clothing, this, at least in women's clothing. This is still being handmade in that period. It takes longer for that to happen. Women's clothing, Part of the difference between men and women's clothing, which industrialized completely differently, is that men's clothing can enter the factory in the early 19th century because fit does not become as important. But women's clothing, remain, like if you picture those Victorian women that we know that are credibly fitted over the corset, that can't enter the factory. It's not until, if you can picture the Gibson girl with those billowy blouses, it's not until the Gibson girl era that women's skirts and blouses can enter factory production because up until that time, it's still very much about the custom fit for the most formal clothing. Not about 1910. Uh, is it possible, and I think it may be, but it hasn't come into your program, uh, if you think in terms of 1775, when we were at war basically with the British, and at that time we were importing everything from Europe, we did not make it here yet, and could that have been an effect where material was not coming in and therefore there was a shortage, would that have had an effect on the change of style from the big full skirt with the uh, slip underneath and the boning to giving the very lightweight fabric that came with the high waist and then a more slim line, partly because of cost due again to the condition of, in history in this country. It's possible that that's why it was so well received here. That that style of gown actually originated in France, and so part of it is Americans looking to Europe and being interested in looking like fashionable Europeans. And so the form wasn't created here, but it was very much embraced here, and maybe there are reasons behind that that, you know, you just, you're investing in a lot less material to make something like that. So that's a good point. Um, there are also changes in larger global economies that make cotton readily available for the first time. And so partly it's just people who are psyched about being able to wear a lightweight gown that really couldn't have done it before. You couldn't get your hands on those kind of fabrics in this quantity previous to that. So that I think that there's something going on there too where it's just something new that people aren't, hadn't had an opportunity to wear before. Well, thanks you all for coming out.